was able to sneak in behind German lines and get himself to a position, a vantage point among above the city of Metz, M-E-T-Z, Metz or Metz, as the French, I think, say. Uh, and the idea was that at a certain point in the German retreat, they had left Metz totally undefended. MacArthur said, I could easily capture Metz. And at that point, the entire German Western Front would have its supply line cut. Huh? Interesting parallels to other issues. Cut the supply lines and the entire German front would collapse. Now, let's assume that General Pershing, the commander on the U.S. side, had had the brains and the guts to accept MacArthur, which he did not do. Hated MacArthur, lifelong. Um, if, if the German army had been routed in chaos, if the German front had come down, that might have meant no Hitler, because if it's clear that you're defeated, right, if the defeat is absolutely beyond uh, any doubt, then it's going to be hard to go with a stab in the back legend when you're, you know, you're obviously routed. So that might have made a big difference in world history. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing, the libertarians, right, the libertarians are now coming to terms with the absolute failure of their agitation as expressed to the Paul Tard family, right, the uh, Paul bearers, Ron Paul, Rand Paul. Rand Paul is now down to 2%. His latest attempt to get attention is to uh, force the District of Columbia to embrace the gun laws that he wants, right, and uh, the animus on uh, some of the programs today against little Rand uh, is is great, right? He's going to be in trouble. He wants guns to be everywhere, but not in the buildings where he works. So he's being pilloried as a hypocrite, whatever you think about guns, yes or guns, no. But uh, un unfortunately, what we're seeing is the libertarians now falling away from Rand Paul are now turning to Trump. And this involves a complete capitulation. It is uh, the rotten ideology of libertarianism playing out its logic. And it is obviously libertarianism is a very unstable compound uh, and it can't really stay as itself. It's got to transmute into something else. So what we're seeing is uh, people lining up to toady to Trump. Uh, and this is unfortunate. Uh, one, if, if we look at Trump, right, from the point of view of a libertarian, uh, Trump says, as we've said, Muslims cheered on the rooftops. I'm sorry, that's a big lie. Uh, Trump says, we need more surveillance. We need a more powerful state for the purpose of surveillance. I don't see how libertarians can accept this. Um, Bin Laden did 9-11. This also... He needs strong government. And now they're, they're saying that Ronald Reagan is the best, uh, as Trump says, the best president. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Our program has uh, come down to our last segment. So let's just say the problem with libertarianism and that kind of ec economics, I've always uh, tried to point to the fact that, um, for example, German Chancellor Brüning destroyed the economy and the political system of Germany in the two years from 1930 to 1932. Uh, Brüning did not himself necessarily become a Nazi, but he made Nazi rule almost inevitable. In other words, he set the situation for the, for the Nazis to... Uh, to take over. And I would venture to say that is the problem with libertarianism. It, it essentially, because of its radical austerity and its radical anti-institutional, anti-state orientation, it threatens a chaos, which is then uh, going to create some kind of, a, of an authoritarian solution. And what we're seeing is that individual libertarians are playing out this logic right now. So my advice to uh, people who are libertarians, come to the tax Wall Street Party. Follow me. We, c we have the solutions. Um, we don't give up on 9-11 uh, truth. We don't give up on fighting the, uh, the rogue network, the secret government, invisible government, parallel government deep state, uh, we are very much attuned to those problems because we fight them day to day, as we can see. You're fighting them in, for example, trying to get a decent policy on Syria. So uh, again, uh, don't join Trump. If you have integrity, come to the tax Wall Street party. Now, um, we've got the Pearl Harbor anniversary. Uh, I uh, still have a manuscript here, which is unfinished. Um, it 
uh, I was going to try to get this out for December 2011. And then, of course, a little something called the Arab Spring came along, and I spent much of that year in places like Libya and in Syria. So I um, still have that, um, and I would reassure people who are interested in that book that it will come. Uh, I'm just not quite able to say when at this point. But then again, let's look at uh, what's involved. We know that, once again, the libertarians, right, the stinnets of the world, the Republicans, the reactionaries, the Chicago Tribune, the Roosevelt haters, the anti-New Deal right-wingers, all of them try to tell you that Franklin D. Roosevelt betrayed the U.S. forces. Well, this is absolute baloney. Um, And remember, I posit a three-level conspiracy. How about this? Uh, Of course, these are three rather separate, disparate conspiracies, although they do interlock. And again, I don't go looking for conspiracies, but you got to report them when you find them. The first point is that, uh, well, the first point is that the way do you understand Pearl Harbor? Compare Pearl Harbor, December 1941, to the most proximate similar event, and that is the fall of France in May, June 1940. The French officer corps was filled with pro-fascist, pro-Hitler, pro-Mussolini sentiments. The American officer corps was also shot through with Roosevelt hating and this idea that anything would be better than Roosevelt. That included Hitler. Certainly Mussolini would have been absolutely welcome to these people. So Kimmel and Short, the two commanders, are incompetent And they're incompetent because they don't want a war against fascist Japan. Uh, And, of course, the main issue is really Hitler. They don't want the U.S. in war against uh, Hitler. So they're incompetent. And they're incompetent because they don't order air reconnaissance and they don't send out the submarines and the destroyers and the light cruisers they have to create some kind of a perimeter of reconnaissance. They have no aircraft warning system. We'll get to this in a second. Secondly, Stimson, Colonel Henry Stimson, which the guy who's praised by the uh, historian uh, Klutznik, I think his name is, uh, Stimson is the evil heart of the Wall Street banking establishment. My God. And if, as if Stimson weren't enough, he has two assistants, and they're literally known as the imps of Satan, the imps of Satan. John J. McCloy later on became the head of the whole Eastern Anglophile banking establishment. Robert Lovett, very influential, chose the entire disastrous Kennedy cabinet, Rusk, McNamara, these horrible, horrible people who brought you the Vietnam War and so forth. Those were chosen by Lovett. This was a terrible mistake by Kennedy. Uh, The goal of Stimson uh, and the imps of Satan was to wreck the New Deal to make sure that Roosevelt would not be able to carry out his threats uh, to liquidate the British Empire, which had been delivered to Churchill in August of 1941, right, at the uh, famous uh, Atlantic Charter, where they meet on the two battleships uh, on the coast of uh, Newfoundland, I think it is. Stimson, McCloy, and Lovett want to make that impossible. And then we have uh, Winston Churchill himself, the fact that the British had been able to break the Japanese JN-25 operational naval code, the one that had to do with military operations, where you could tell what the Japanese were going to do and when. This is the um, Russ Bridger and Nave study. The U.S. had the purple code, the diplomatic code. That's fine. But the JN-25 is what you need, and the U.S. doesn't have it. So it's the interplay of these these levels. The fascist or Roosevelt-hating may be better. Roosevelt-hating sympathies of Kimmel and Short, the uh, determination by Stimson to get some disaster, uh, and this is complicated also by McCloy and Lovett, and then the uh, Winston Churchill withholding the information, right, not sharing it. And this, this is, a, you know, Lord Halifax never went to the White House late at night to tell Roosevelt what was happening. So um, here's the problem. If you're doing air defense in 1941, you are oriented towards one thing, the tremendous effort of the British to defeat the Luftwaffe 
in the Battle of Britain in September 1940. And what this revolved around was a an aircraft warning system. Now, the aircraft warning systems had been pioneered by um, General uh, Chenault in China. Uh, in order to do it his way, you had to have a politically sympathetic population, and he did. So therefore, he's kind of a rooted in the people air defense system. But the way the British did it was, of course, the Dowding system, D-O-W, D-O-W-D-I-N-G. And this involved the uh, chain home aircraft uh, warning system, the radar systems, but then also ground observers, watchers along the coasts, uh, and then bring it all together in a filter room, uh, in a, uh, a kind of a central point where all the information flowed together. And you've seen these, these films, I think, from the 1940s where they're pushing these markers around on the map of uh, southeast England. Now, if you want to defend Pearl Harbor, what you're going to need is to coordinate the naval aviation that you have with the Army aviation, the Army Air Force that you have. Now, I recommend a book. It's called Defenseless. Defenseless, Command Failure at Pearl Harbor by John W. Lambert and Norman Polmar. Norman Polmar is a pretty establishment kind of uh, naval historian. So the idea is that Kimmel and Short fail to realize that the overwhelming imperative is to set up a filter room, or as they were going to call it, the aircraft warning system. So they... They didn't appreciate this. They were not interested. They dawdled. Um, and th therefore, the doubting system, which would have been the obvious place to start for anybody with a brain, this was not uh, implemented. Let's just see. We had doubting came to, uh, to visit the United States. For example, in New York and Boston, this system of aircraft warning service, or filter room, as the British uh, called it, this was implemented at New York and Boston. And Air Vice Marshal Hugh Dowding, the architect of the British victory there, who had directed the Royal Air Force defenses in the Battle of Britain, inspected these U.S. centers and approved them. So the idea was that the uh, U.S. Army-Navy combine in Hawaii was supposed to set up the same thing except that Kimmel and Short didn't give a damn. They were caught flat-footed. They did not prepare. They failed to send out aircraft, the PBY Catalinas. They failed to send the destroyers, the submarines, and the light cruisers, which mounted aircraft for reconnaissance on the back. So that's the Pearl Harbor story. And we'll see you next week on World Crisis Weekend.